Mike, is there a limit to the number of members of the Special Pants Brigade? John, there is not. Well, that's a good thing, because today we got two more inductees. Hi everyone, welcome to today's badge cam lesson here at Active Self Protection. I'm your host, John Correa. I'm your co-host, Mike Williver. Today's video comes to us from, actually, my sister sent it to us, didn't she? She did. From Frederick, Maryland. Today's video was brought to us by Mantis. The Mantis family of products is integral to ASP staff building handgun and carbine skills and are your most economical and fastest path to improvement in your skills too. Whether you choose the X10, the Laser Academy, the Blackbeard, or use them all in concert, they will help your practice be more effective, efficient, and fun. Go check them out, pick up a unit, and thank them for sponsoring today's video. The initial call here is a man apparently waving a gun around in this kind of complex, and officers don't know what's going on. They're gonna contact him for the first time. Let's listen in on the badge cam. Hey, what's going on? What's up? You mind stepping down for me? Yep. Shots fired. I think I'm hit. Don't you move. I'm hit too. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Oh, f Okay? No. I'm bleeding. Me too. Put your hands out. Put your hands out to your side. Put your hands out to your side. Put your hands. Okay, we have my gun, we're at the intersection. We're both hit. Ah! Uh, don't you move! You okay? I don't know. I'm hit up in yeah. the. Yeah! I don't think so. Hurts. Keep it. Uh, keep on. I'm gonna go in. Do not move. You understand? Do not move. The gun's underneath it. Alright, I'm getting six hands. Alright. Do not move. 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 Do not Right. Right 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 both officers and the suspect were hit here. You can go watch the original. It's got a whole bunch more context of them taking him into custody and tending to his wounds. Both officers were hit. They were all th three transported to the same trauma medical center. All three made it through. And the officers are both uh, recovering and expected to make complete recoveries. This one happened long enough ago that our suspect here was actually declared not mentally competent for his actions. He had had a some kind of a like a, a, a psychotic break that he said he knew God was going to bring him somebody to gunfight that day and through a, a long process was declared mentally unfit. So he has been committed to a mental hospital. Basically, it's a prison for where those who have are, are declared mentally incompetent, where he will be for the next several decades. Functionally, he's in prison for life. Hey, I want you to take a moment in the comments to congratulate Mike on running a top 0.5% worldwide podcast. True story, yeah? Uh, true story, absolutely. Thanks to, thanks to the good name of Active Self Protection. If not for that, I would still be talking to three people in my basement. But as it turns out, I'm not. So thank you so much for listening and watching on the app. And if you are not listening or watching the video version on the app, you wrong.
Mike, I really think this one is a kind of a tricky call. I, you know, it's, it's, so somebody reports in, hey, there's a man waving a gun around, but you know, you don't know what is actually going on here. What did somebody see? And so, you know, okay, they parked their car. They kind of approach from a long way away, but I, I think it's a tricky one to try to figure out how am I going to approach? There's a balancing act, John. Anytime you approach a situation like this, obviously you want to tip the scales in favor of the safety of you, your partner, the general public, to the extent that you can. Um, but running up with guns out, you know, aimed at the guy or whatever and screaming and yelling is definitely not the approach you want to take. For all we know, this is a prank call or somebody's mad at this guy and is calling in fake, you know, fake gun threats or whatever. So you got to be careful. But let's make sure we balance the scales in favor of our safety and that of the public. And I think one way they could have maybe done that was to maybe have a little bit more standoff, not get quite so close quite so quickly. Um, it may seem awkward to talk to somebody from, you know, 10 yards away or whatever. But until we know kind of what this guy is about and gauge his mental state and some other things. I would prefer to see him just keep a little bit more distance. That's all. Other than that, these guys did a, I mean, just a commendable job. Yeah. And remember when you close the distance like that and cops are taught, take people into custody, right? Close distance, take control. Remember proximity negates skill. This guy doesn't have to be very good with a gun. And if you are good with a gun, you maintain your skill advantage at a little bit of distance. Now I will say, remember what we talk about. First, you look at the eyes, the eyes are the windows to the soul. The hands are the windows to the intent. The waste is where everything bad comes from. First, we look at the eyes, and if you look at his eyes here, I don't see anything that says to me, oh no, this guy wants to kill me. Now, he is having a psychotic break, okay? So, so I, I'm not saying this is a foolproof way, but if you're looking at him, he kind of looks over at the officer and he's like, oh, okay, fine, whatever. He doesn't have that crazy googly-eyed look. And, and this is one of the things that we say, yes, look at the eyes, and we always focus on the face, but we gotta move beyond that, otherwise danger could be lurking where we're not paying attention. I've been criticized before, John, and maybe rightly so, for saying that certain suspects are a little too calm. They're a little bit too nonchalant, a little bit too casual. And what I meant by that was anyone approached by the police in a way, in a sort of semi-confrontational way like this, it's going to be uncomfortable and weird. And so if you or I, you know, just normal Joe citizen were approached in public by the police like this, we would probably sit up straight and be like, hey, what's going on? You know, there would be a normal human reaction. And when someone has zero reaction like that, when they they stay right at their baseline of super calm, you know, super calm demeanor, it, it I'm not saying it means they're guilty of anything at all. It's never what I meant by that. What I mean is it's odd and it should be a little bit of a red flag to go, OK, something isn't quite right here. Um, sometimes that happens and everything's fine. But most times if someone's this calm when the police approach him, it's for a reason. Yeah, and you look here, he kind of looks away, right? So he makes some eye contact, but he doesn't really respond. That's a little odd. So we move from looking at the eyes to looking at the hands. You look at this guy's hands here, he's got a cigarette in his left hand, his right hand is visible, he doesn't have anything in his hands. So from a threat matrix kind of assessment here, I think the officers are doing an okay job. Now that said, again, recognizing the fact that he then looks away, that he's not responding to the officers being there, is indicative, eh, something's not right here. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, as far as somebody reaching for something, we're going to see that. Obviously, the people have already seen that part of the video, but during the breakdown, we're going to see, obviously, that he reaches uh, into his left side, left pocket for a firearm. Uh, this is why I prefer a little bit of distance here um, until we establish kind of a baseline and figure out what this guy's go what's going on with his day, with his mental state. Because if you're in this close, unless your partner is grabbing the other hand simultaneously, grabbing the one arm, uh, in the way that it was done. Um, unless you're a super ninjutsu master 5000 and you know some way to grab both arms, you know, from the side like this, I don't see how it's practical. Uh, I would have preferred to see him hold off a little bit more and have a little bit more distance and kind of ask the guy, hey, why don't you step down? Hey, could you, could you show me that you don't have any weapons? Just lift your shirt up real quick, whatever. Um, that's not always practical, but in this case, I think it might have, it might have given them an extra second to react when he did pull the gun. Yeah, because we say, right, the eyes are the windows to soul, hands are the windows to the intent, the waistline is where all the bad things come from. In this case, I think a pocket in his jacket is where he ended up pulling it from. So, so I know, officers, you're taught, rush in, you know, get in, get control, get everybody in custody that needs to be in custody, but sometimes slowing your roll a little bit, talking from a little bit of distance, not going in that fast, not putting hands on the guy that fast, could have seen where this one is coming from and maybe changed things. I don't know, man, this guy wanted to have a gunfight. I'm not blaming these officers at all. And I think that as fast as it happens, and we're gonna see here as, as I kind of make it in slow-mo that this guy's gonna decide, nope, I'm drawing a gun from here. Now I'm gonna pull that. <clears throat> I'm gonna shoot the female officer first is what he does, but watch how fast it comes back on our male officer whose badge cam we're watching is he comes back around this fast to get that guy and get shots on him as well. And remember officers, 
you're always at an initiative deficit, which is why you want to keep that distance if you can, because it minimizes that. But you're, you're going to be second to go. The gunfight starts when the bad guy pulls a gun and starts using it on you. And so you're always going to be at that kind of initiative deficit, which is why you've got to have such an attitude of overcoming and a high skill set. Yeah, in addition to not getting so close, let, let me just point something out here. I've had a few encounters, street encounters with crooks, you know, bad guys, gangbangers, whatever. And a thing happened very quickly. This this entire sequence of events where he goes from putting a hand on to his partner getting shot to him getting shot took about one second. Um, it's going to come up later. We talk about saying off the radio. These things happen so very quickly that before that, before the second officer knew what happened, he was already shot. So he's behind the eight ball. Now he's shot behind the eight ball. So I, I think understanding the speed at which these encounters happen is super critical to officers and deputies out there on the street. We, we go from zero to, oh, crap, really, really quickly here. And I think uh, another thing, the, the female officer on the other side, we're going to see her badge cam here in a moment. Uh, I, I, I would have would have preferred to see her back up a couple steps and draw a gun in this instance. But, you know, it's a super lightning fast reaction and we just kind of do what we do. Yeah. <clears throat> and kudos to both our officers who are both shot. And our officer gets back in the fight and gets his gun in the fight. And, and again, he's shot here. <clears throat> Huge initiative problem. And he's badly injured, but he gets his gun out and gets shots on him. And yes, we can talk a little bit about the grip. But first, let's talk about attitude before skills. Incredible attitude of, I'm still alive, I'm still conscious, I got a problem in front of me, I'm going to solve that problem. He does that excellently. And yes, I think if, you've, if, if you have practiced your grip enough, if you know that that grip is coming hard and hot, and you have done it so many times that you can't do anything else, that's what you'll do when all the chips are down. So this does tell me that his skill set with his gun in hand is maybe not as ingrained as it should be. But but let's be very clear. The attitude overcomes everything and we see attitude win the day a whole awful lot. I would go so far as to say, John, that attitude, uh, equipment, the quality of your equipment and your skill set are all co-equal, um, generally speaking, in law enforcement. All three of those things need to be as high as you can get them. The best equipment you could possibly get your hands on, the best and most training, the most recent training you can get your hands on. And the attitude is something only you have any effect over. The department doesn't control your attitude. Your partner doesn't control your attitude. You control your attitude. So that attitude of, I am going to... I, I may have stepped into a, a wasp nest here, but I'm going to bat my way out of it and I'm going to get home today is something that can't really be trained. You have to have that in and of yourself. And the attitude is what carried these two officers that day. I don't know about their training and I don't know about their equipment, but their attitude was such that they were going to they were going to end this fight the way it needed to be ended and get home. That's exactly what they did. And it was very, very commendable. This should be shown at academies as far as what to do after your shot. You don't lie down and moan and groan. If you, if you can possibly do it, you get up and you finish the fight. Yeah, I will say here, our cover officer, you notice here, they've done a good job of splitting, right? So they're not back behind each other. That's a very good thing. But recognize that when you're the cover officer, when you dive in like this, if you weren't together at the same time, says, hey, we're both gonna go get this guy's hands, you probably wanna be a step or two back. So then that way you have a little more perspective and you have a little bit more opportunity to get your gun in the fight if you want to. It's a small nitpick. I think that this female officer did a pretty okay job, all things considered. But remember when you're the cover officer, part of that cover is having a little bit of space so that it all doesn't go back for both of you. Yeah, agreed. You know, people are gonna probably come at me for, for talking on both sides of my mouth here, but at the same time, I understand why people would think, hey, she should get in there and, and grab that arm. That's probably what she was going to do in this moment. But once that gun comes out, um, it looks like she maybe, maybe was trying to control the gun or do something, but I really just, officers, I wanna see you get your gun in the fight right away. Don't try anything else. Now, if you're, if, if this hasn't started yet and you're on top of the person and the gun comes out, that's one thing. But if you're this far away or further away, it's time for your gun to come out. I would have preferred to see that. But again, I don't want to criticize these officers too much. They, they, they did a hell of a job. She really did. And, and listen, stayed in the fight. Okay, fine. She made the decision. Ends up, she gets shot too. And now she does the same, gets her gun out and gets it in the fight. Kudos to her for that. I want to stop here just a second, and I want to recognize this is literally, literally the very worst backstop it could possibly be. You've literally got a bus full of kids on the other side of you. Is marksmanship important? It's incredibly important. Now, our officer is using her gun with one hand. Why? I don't know. I don't know if she was injured in the other arm. I'm almost positive that why she's there and she's got that in only one hand is because she's using her other hand to talk on the radio. Remember, win the fight first then worry about getting on the radio. There's nobody that's coming to save you one time. You gotta win the fight. Put two hands on the gun, because you miss high here, you start endangering kids. 
Yeah, agreed. Um, I think you covered everything there is to be covered about the marksmanship angle. Yeah, obviously, um, if you're going to miss, you want to miss low, but really you don't want to miss at all. You want to hit your target as quickly as you possibly can. As far as her other hand goes, let me address the idea of emergency buttons on portable radios. If you get out of the car, your radio should be on. I think we all agree on that. Your radio should be turned on. Preferably you have a headset so the bad guys don't hear what you're talking about or what, what you're being told about them. They have a warrant or whatever the case may be. And most importantly, there should be an emergency button on every police radio in the United States. Most agencies I've worked with had them, and there should be a protocol for what to do when the emergency button is activated. And that protocol should be, hey, we get as much help there as quickly as possible. We assume the worst if the emergency button's been pressed. If you have time during this encounter to press that button, press it and stay in the fight. Um, if it's going to distract you or prevent you from being you know, as present in that fight as possible, don't even do that. I don't know, like you said, John, was she on the radio? Was she reaching to, to feel for a wound or whatever? I, I don't know, but I would have preferred to see two hands on the gun. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Now, I know some folks are going to ask about this last shot, right? Like some folks are going to be like, well, guy's kind of face down there. You know, is this last shot justifiable? I think we're going to give her a pretty broad pass here. I think if she's a private citizen, this dude just pulled a gun on her and he has shot her. And so she goes, nope, I still see him moving at all. And, and I'm afraid that I'm going to lose consciousness because I'm shot. My partner's shot. I'm not taking that chance. I don't really have a problem with it. I will say though, at some point you do gotta stop and you do have to have reasonable objective evidence for why you press the trigger every single time. We're gonna give you some, some leeway here and I think this officer earned that leeway and I think she did an okay job. But I do wanna recognize, this is one of the reasons that we have badge camps so we're asking questions like this and I'm okay with that. Yeah, and I can see, you know, I agree with your assessment, by the way. I think um, I think the shot was was reasonable. It was within the realm, bounds of reason. Um, but I can absolutely understand why other people would disagree with that, why they would see this and think that was egregious or that was over the top. Um, I don't think that it was. I, I, I would like to see anyone in the comment section who wants to say that that was, a, you know, a terrible, awful, terrible thing. Okay, well, then let's shoot you <laughs> and see how, how reasonable you're able to be. I think she was extremely reasonable under the circumstances. She'd just been shot. Her partner had been shot. Um, and right now, she doesn't know the condition of her partner. She doesn't know if, if he is bleeding to death or if she is bleeding to death or what's going to happen next. Right now, basically, her and all the backup that's practically useful to her is very damaged and potentially going to be unconscious any second. So you have to take that into consideration when looking at shots like that. You really do. Now, let's also think about... Her partner and again you can see here on camera he's hurt and he's bleeding badly and that is bright red arterial blood and that is a ick amount of it right so when you know we talk about as somebody who teaches trauma medical you know and and, and emergency first aid listen when you see this this is the amount if, if we have an amount of blood that makes us go ick and if we have especially bright red arterial blood, we need to start assessing that. And if that's on a limb, we need a tourniquet on that limb right now. This amount of bleeding absolutely meets the ick standard. Bright red arterial blood, I need to see right now. Is that wound in his arm? If it is, I need to get a tourniquet on that right now. If it's not, if it is instead, if it's snuck into a, to a junction or something like that, remember we tourniquet limbs, we pack junctions. This is why officers, I can't say enough, you need your first aid kit on your person, enough for you or your partner in order to stop major traumatic bleeding on you and you need to have the skills to use it. He waits around quite a long time here, Mike, and I really think, thank God, you know, end up no harm, no foul in terms of what the end result was, but he needs to holster up that gun, let her uh, deal with covering that guy and start treating this injury because this could be life-threatening. 100%, you know, and again, I have to commend his 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 demeanor and, and both of their demeanor and attitude to stay covering down on this guy. It's, it's, a, it's a judgment call. If you're out there in the field, like I said a moment ago, neither one of them knows the exact condition of their partner. They don't know if they have backup. Their backup could be unconscious in, in five or 10 seconds. Um, so it's, it's a hard call to make in the moment. But I think at this point, you see your, he could see her part, his partner is at least up and has a gun on. At very least, holster up and start addressing that wound sooner than later because, you know, you're losing blood that quickly. Uh, the next thing is to lose consciousness. And I think the distinction between packing and tourniqueting a wound is, is important. Um, if you're not even law enforcement, you can go out and take a stop the bleed class. I recommend everybody get that kind of training because understanding the way the circulatory system works and, and what is and is not a life-threatening uh, loss of blood is important. 
and you could just be a regular person driving down the street passing and heck john has passed car accidents and been able to use that those skills so i highly recommend everyone get them but i think this officer made a judgment call like look i'm not sure this guy's going to pop back up so i need to stay on this a couple more seconds but this is a great mental rep for all the officers watching and, th and i think at the end of the day listen these officers did as best they could, right? Thank God the secondary officer finally shows up. Let's get this guy in custody. He needs to get some tr some treatment his way. Both the officers need to get treatment their way as well. You know, you saw kind of some of these private citizens kind of nope out of there at the end. Listen, man, if you don't want to help the officers, hey, officers, can I help you with medical aid or something like that? They go, no, I, we want you out of here. No problem. Get the heck out of there. Uh, when the secondary officer shows up, okay, I need to get you some medical care right now. Let's see what's going on with you. These officers stayed in the fight. God bless them for that. I'm glad that they did. I'm glad that they ended the threat. Let's get that medical care started quickly to cover our ASP.